Hey, let's talk about some context or set some context. So we have artificial intelligence, large language models in the last year, a lot of complexity in the world, uh, rapid product uh, or shorter product life cycles, shorter product and company life cycles. Yep. Uh, misinformation, disinformation. We have global wars. We have supply chain issues. We have a pandemic. Uh, what else can you add to that current context? Uh, I don't know. It sounds quite utopian to me already. So, you know, just smooth yeah. sailing going forward. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong next, right? That's right. So at, at the moment, organizations, people, individuals, we're trying to figure out how do you navigate uh, this this context, right? It's something that we've never seen, the acceleration of technology. Yep. Uh, and you have an idea that you worked out with uh, Gene Kim called Wiring yep. the Organization, a new book yep. coming out here shortly. So Dr. Spear, great to have you on the show. Uh, love to talk about the book and clearly uh, more about talk more about the things you've done in the past with the uh, high velocity edge to work with the U.S. Navy and so forth. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate the time. Awesome. Okay. So just glancing at what's in your new book, um, you have something called um, Slowify, right? Yep. And when I'm reading this, I'm starting to think more about tempo versus speed. And, you know, when I'm, you're training kids to shoot baskets and become better <laughs> athletes, you actually have to slow down to speed up. Is that, is that where you're going with this? Yeah, a hundred percent. So let, let's set some context. And I think, you know, you and I come from very different backgrounds, but we've had similar experiences. And let me explain what sounds paradoxical is that, uh, you know, you're coming out of the military with years of experience there and I'm coming out of some combination of uh, industry and academia and whatnot, but we've both been, you know, obviously impressed by and fascinated by organizations which can do so much more with so much less relative to everybody else. Mm -hmm. And this ties into this whole notion of slowification and the other mechanisms we have in our book, which is when you start looking at these organizations, it's wildly level playing fields, right? Um, people are competing more or less in the same market space or competitive space. They're trying to accomplish more or less the same things as their counterparts. They have access to similar resources, uh, raw materials, capital equipment, et cetera. The regulatory framework, legal framework is more or less for the same. Um, and yet, uh, there are just those who do so much more with so much less. And so the question is, you know, what's the difference between them and everybody else? And the answer is they, they, they put the minds of the people in their enterprise to much better use towards solving hard problems for which the solutions have great value mm -hmm. than anywhere else. And so, um, and our entire book is, is framed around this idea that management systems deliberately have to be architected and operated around the cognitive ability of people individually and collaboratively to solve hard problems. So um, with that, we talk about mechanisms in the book that help mm -hmm. people get from places where it's very, very hard to solve hard problems. We call that place the danger zone. Things are fast mm -hmm. moving, they're very complex, the risks are very high. We don't have much control over the situation. Uh, we have very little opportunity for iteration and learning loops. And how do you get from, from the danger zone down to the winning zone Mm -hmm. and the winning zone is that place where all those conditions are the same but opposite, right? Yet you have right. control, you have um, a chance to get some iteration and learning loops. The complexity is dropped down, the, the risks have dropped down. And so we talk about ways in which you can go from that danger zone down to that winning zone. And one of them we call slowification is to change the context in which you're asking people to apply their intellect. Right. And the term slowification is a very deliberate, explicit acknowledgement of Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Mm -hmm. And in that book, Kahneman, you know, and building on his work and that of his uh, late colleague, Amos Tversky, right. he says, look, you know, we have two modes of thinking. And, and he, he's not dismissive of either, right? He says, there's this fast thinking thing, and we can call it biases, and that sounds prejudicial. Mm -hmm. but he says, no, no. We've built up habits, routines, biases, you know, kind of muscle memory, what we might call of how to behave in a certain situation so we can get to a good outcome very, very quickly. And right. if the situation is moving fast, we have to depend on muscle memory because there's no time for our brains to really work. And, and he, he acknowledges that's actually a very important skill to have to build up muscle memory. Mm -hmm. But the other thing Kahneman you know, points out is that sometimes if you're in a new situation and you're reverting, you're reverting to your well-honed habits, routines, biases, et cetera, you can actually get to very bad answers. Right. And he said, you know, and his point is that you really have to engage in um, slow thinking, which can be deliberative. It could be reflective. It could be self-critical. It could be generative. Yeah. And so in the book, we uh, spend quite a bit of time talking about exemplar organizations and how they go out of their way to get people out of 
fast thinking, you know, the impulsive, reactive, you got to give me an answer right now kind of thing mm-hmm. and allow them to be contemplative, generative and creative individually and, and collectively. Yeah. Well, there's so much to unpack there. Uh, one couple of things that came up to mind here is I, I believe when you're in the danger zone, uh, it's okay, right? It's okay to be over there. In fact, I believe you want to be there and be a little comfortable there. Uh, right. That's the exploration type of space where you need to use these tools and techniques. We can talk about those here in a moment to bring it over to the uh, the winning zone. And and that yeah. is uh, very fantastic. The the Kahneman point about going from system one to system two, and, and it's really, you know, we know it's a network. It's not your brain is broken up into system one and system. It's it's the way it, it's, it's yeah. just a metaphor, if you will. Um, the idea here is that's orientation, right? We, we really struggle with um, getting people to slow down. We'll, we'll use yep. red team techniques. We'll use the, anything to go from system one. Again, it's a network to system two or network two thinking. And that yep. is very, very tough to do because it creates, it requires energy, high energy, right? Um, and, and it's, yes. it's kind of uncomfortable to take people there. Um, mm-hmm. That is something that uh, is, is absolutely in our wheelhouse. And the orientation piece, I want to go back to it. You talked about biases, heuristics, things like that. Um, that's part of who we are, right? It's, it's, it's in our DNA. It's, it's we're, yep. we're humans. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to do something. We have to act to reorient that and adjust and, and update our mind, if you will, update our orientation. Yep. Uh, the basic idea here is you can uh, change the world or update your mind, right? right A lot right. of people are a lot of people are too busy trying to change the world without updating their minds. And, and that's, that's a problem. Right. And, I, and I think that's, I think uh, what I'm hearing from you and based on our previous, com- previous conversations in your work, there's a lot of overlap with uh, uh, how, how we kind of see the world, which is, which is great. So I'm really looking mm-hmm. forward to getting my hands on this book. Um, slow. So tempo, I, you know, I was kind of reading uh, some of Gene's ideas on, on how the concept of slowification, slow if I came up, mm-hmm. uh, and this kind of reminded me of, of tempo. And it's a hard mm-hmm. thing to think about. And I'm going to use something from Theory of Constraints, uh, the drum, buffer, rope thing, right? Drum, right? Yep. That, that cadence. Um, that cadence doesn't limit us to go faster. You can always, when you have a cadence, you can actually play uh, shorter notes, right? If you want to use a, yep. a music as an analogy. But that tempo is so critical that um, it's it's kind of like that drum beat, the heartbeat of the organization, right? You can, and that that's where we're going to, find our advantage um, by using, I'm going to say slowification in this case, case to really uh, accelerate uh, mm-hmm. um, how we work as humans, that people process and things. So where am I wrong in anything I, I, I fed back to you? No, and, it's, and, it's, it's hundred percent right. It is, um, is our, our brains operate to a certain tempo and our bodies operate to a certain tempo. And if we're going to put our bodies into situations, which the tempo is faster than our brains can work, then what yep. we have to do is gives our brains an opportunity to teach our bodies how to operate at that faster tempo. Um, and that's happening now, right? I mean, when you think about how AI and acceleration technologies uh, yeah. and, and mental health, right? That's happening around us at the moment. So that's you right. have to do that. Yeah, yeah we, we talk in the book about um, three phases uh, and moving back. Um, there's the performance phase. And sometimes the performance phase is very unforgiving. And you know it from your, mm-hmm. your career. Mm-hmm. You just don't have time to think because things are happening so fast. Mm-hmm. And if it's not built into heuristics, your muscle memory, whatever you want to call it, you just won't get to a good answer. And so the question then is, um, how do you build that muscle memory? And the answer is that you have to be a very aggressive learner um, during your planning phase. And you know, mm-hmm. you guys have terms like uh, red teaming and forceful backup and things like mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. where planning is not, oh, I just you know throw crap up on the board and then say, oh, that's the best it is. No, I do throw crap up on the board. And then I step back and I ask you, I don't try to pitch you on what I've thrown up on the board. I say, now, Ponch, can you find all the reasons this is crap? So now mm-hmm. we can go through and cycle very, very quickly and try to improve on it. And then um, once we've uh, run out of our ability to find flaws in the thinking of the crap that's thrown on the board, then we put it into practice. And again, I think some people have this um, misunderstanding that practice is to take the plan off the board and then make sure that Steve and Ponch can execute on it. Yeah. And, and the truth is, um, the purpose of practice in the best organizations is actually to still find flaws in the thinking. Because mm-hmm. if you and I can't execute on the plan, it, that's a sign that the plan is wrong because it's depending on you and me to execute on it. And if we can't execute on it, then we've picked the wrong plan. In, right. the, in the book, I make a passing reference, um, and we've made reference in other articles and stuff. There's a phenomenal um, 
phenomenal book called Shattered Sword. It's about the Battle of Midway. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, it's written from the Japanese perspective. So uh, and just, I want to. So after you and I met in 2019, yep. you yep. talked about that. Actually, you talked, and I went and got that book, and it's yep. a fantastic book. It, it really uh, illuminated how I thought about or think about World War II, right? So, yeah. Uh, please continue. Yeah. So, you know, Parshall and Tully, who are the authors of uh, Shattered Sword, they ask this uh, paradoxical question. How is it the United States Navy showed up at the Battle of Midway, June 1942, outmanned, outgunned, outshipped, outplaned, outpiloted, da, 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 and beat uh, on, on paper, at least a superior Japanese fleet? And um, it, it's, a, it's one of these wild books because they go through, ex in not excruciating, but tremendous detail about the Japanese experience to the level of a pilot in a cockpit or a sailor who's in a in a, um, you know, below deck when a bomb hits and flame. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible reading. You could, you could film a movie just from their level of detail. And then at the very end of the book, they say, um, they say, so reader, when do you think the Japanese lost the Battle of Midway? And the answer is, you know, spoiler for, so if anyone's going to read the book, you know, fingers in the air right now, the answer is 1929. And you're like, what the hell? You know, because you go back and, and 1929 is not even in the book. And they say, here's the thing. By 1929, the Japanese Admiralty had settled on what they their concept of operations around what they thought um, about how war would be waged in the Pacific. Now, bearing in mind in 1929, the technology had an advance to so that. It was a very arrogant sort of, right. you know, put things, uh, set things in stone. And from 1929 on, uh, everything was about executing to this concept of operations that the Admiralty had come up with. And um, in fact, they say, even in the uh, the weeks before the Battle of Midway, when they were running war games, you know, tabletop exercises on their uh, battle plan, and uh, the people standing in for the Americans figured out how to beat it, the Japanese admiral admiralty concluded that the problem was the people standing in as, as avatars for the, mm -hmm. um, the U.S. It wasn't that there was something wrong with the battle plan. It was that they weren't actually or accurately reflecting how the U.S. would fight. And they had three, four, five shots at this. And um, what Tully and, and his co-author say is that in contrast, in the same period, the United States Admiralty was taking a very different approach. They understood that um, if they were going to project power over the Pacific and possibly come in conflict with the Japanese Navy, they needed an answer. But they never sat down and said, oh, this is the answer. Instead, they went through this um, series of... Uh, what you and I would call exercises, but they were deliberately dubbed fleet problems. Mm -hmm. And so when they looked at the Pacific, they said, well, you know, how do you project power into the Pacific? And in the early 20s, no one had an answer. They said, and they agreed they didn't have an answer, but they said, you know, we might have to move uh, assets from the Atlantic through the Pacific through the Panama Canal. So they set up an exercise first at the War College, you know, tabletop mm -hmm. stuff, but then they went out to sea. And they told one group of sailors and ships to defend the Panama Canal, another group to attack the Panama Canal. And uh, they just wanted to see what would happen. Now, th they went through these 20 some odd fleet problems. The Panama Canal was three of those because they, they didn't get to, the, to, to an answer, an adequate answer. They had uh, landing uh, troops on, on, um, on islands, you know, the amphibious stuff, uh, supporting mm -hmm. garrisons, refueling at sea. Um, operating independently when you didn't have uh, adequate communication. But here, here was the key thing. And this is the, uh, the using practice for this uh, aggressive feedback is that uh, whereas the Japanese Admiralty kept, you know, firing as it were, the people standing in for the U.S. during the stress test of their battle plan, the U.S. leaders would have hot washes, you know, debriefs at the end of each day of these fleet problems. And they didn't do it down in their wardroom with their other senior leaders and on and on. They did it on deck and they just opened it up to like, you know, whoever was part of it, you know, call out. And in the book, we, um, we make, we distinguish between a, a yes admiral, you know, it was sort of, sort of that, you know, Japanese deep bow genuflecting towards the senior leader. And we set up, you know, in contrast, one could imagine this was filmed by John Ford or something like that. Hmm. The, uh, the the uh, the wise ass from Brooklyn with the stoic Minnesotan and the Hispanic dude from L.A. So you know, and they're going like, "Yo, Admiral, what were you thinking?" You know, yeah. and and that kind of thing. Okay, and um, so we set up this contrast of a uh, yes, Admiral, yo, Admiral. But anyway, back to slowification. Slowification is uh, letting us get into that yo, Admiral kind of behavior yeah. when we're still planning, when we're still practicing, so that when we're performing, we got all the kinks worked out.
Yeah. So, so wow, that great, fantastic story. Uh, and then what I'm thinking right now is planning. Uh, planning is continuous. We always tell folks that it's not something you do and hand off. And I think right. uh, where you and our backgrounds with more in the operational excellence, uh, a lot of safety connections. We talk about the, the the black line and the blue line and things like that. You know, work mm -hmm. is imagined versus work is done. We're trying to get organizations to see that you can't just come up with a plan and and your ivory tower and hand it off to execute somewhere else. That's yep. that's the big problem. That is fundamental thing because if those yep. that are executing don't understand the why, the the what, they're not going to really understand the how. Right. They're not going to come up with new. And, and vice versa, the people who are doing the planning, unless they're at the deck plate or the shop floor yep. or the work site and actually seeing the context in which they're asking people to do things, how yep. are they possibly going to come up with an adequate plan? Yeah. 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 And I, I tell you, I just uh, got back from some uh, on-site delivery. And one of the biggest challenges was understanding what that organization organization did. They did not know why they yep. existed. They ex And here's what they gave me. We exist to align and to communicate. And I'm like, on what <laughs> right and, and you may be confusing means and ends yeah yeah so, so right. this is this is absolutely i think this is a critical uh c connection between the work you're doing and what needs to be done inside of organizations is uh really bring those what do you call them the yo yo uh yo admiral and no, what, what, what yes the admiral turn that into yo admiral yeah 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 so the those folks that are actually doing the work bring them in and find yep. it's, it's knowledge work for a reason, right? I mean, you have to yep. bring those that are closest to the work in to really understand um, what, what yeah. the big picture looks like. You know, and Punch, one thing I'll just pick up on that term is um, this notion of knowledge work. You know, we mm -hmm. live in a day and an age, and you're talking about AI and machine learning, and all this stuff which generated by a bunch of nerdy dudes taping away on keyboards. <laughs> and somehow we've gotten it in our heads that, you know, knowledge work requires that you have advanced degrees and a keyboard. And otherwise, you know, um, I, I distinguish between two types of people: those who um, those who take a shower in the morning to get ready for work, and the, those who take a shower at the end of the day to wash their work away. Mm -hmm. And it, it's the people who take showers in the morning um, who think that they do knowledge work because they get up and they take a shower and fa uh, you know whatever you do. You and I used to put on ties, but no one does mm -hmm. now. But um, then they sit down and type away, and that's somehow knowledge work. But the dude who's working in uh, in, in, in the man and the woman is working in a mill that somehow mm -hmm. that's, that's not, but you know that when you're working in a mill, that stuff is throwing problems at you all the time. And, um, you don't have a keyboard to, you know, where you're trying to capture what you're doing and how to fix the problem, but it's knowledge work nonstop because it, you know, part of the, the, the physicality of the work, um, requires that you're seeing problems, you're solving problems, you're putting solutions into practice. It, this is the digression. I, sorry, it becomes a real personal rant for me because I have a bias against those who are condescending towards those who have to take the shower at night, not in the morning. Yeah. Um, Paul O'Neill, you know, who ran Alcoa and then he was Secretary of Treasury. He he was a, a mentor for twenty years for me, and I mm -hmm. I, I I think I feel it's fair for me to say we became friends, and I really am feeling blessed by that friendship and that mentorship. And uh, Alcoa's experience was over a, you know, a multi-year period, they took these high-risk, high-hazard processes of molten metal and caustic chemicals and crushing weights and you know, that kind of thing, and turned themselves into the safest employer, not manufacturing employer, but the safest employer in the country, mm -hmm. yep. while driving everything else positive, you know, yield, quality, on-time delivery, on and on and on. And when he asked Paul what was his uh, secret, he said, well... It's easy because everyone else who runs facilities like the ones that we have, they assume that the job of the worker's body is to show up in, in the morning, put the lunchbox in the in the cabinet, check the brain for the day, and then go out and just apply horsepower onto mm -hmm. these big industrial processes. And so what we do at Alcoa is we sit when the when the body comes in the door, we say, you know, hang up your coat, put your lunchbox away, but we're really appreciative that you brought the brain in to help us solve problems every day. And he said, look, you know, if you have tens of thousands of employees and uh, your competitor is competing based on the handful of brains in headquarters and the handful of brains in a laboratory, and you've got tens of thousands of brains on your team, you're going to win every flipping yeah. day. Yeah. And so anyway, anyway, sorry for going off on a, a rant. No, I, 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 I'm the same. Uh, you know, being right? a fighter aviation, being a naval officer, 
uh, doing what we do. It's th- that's what works. People process and ideas and, or things in that order. Right? No, it's not and the other way. Think about it. Imagine, you know, back, back when you were doing that, getting into a plane and then thinking that, mm-hmm. oh, the, uh, the, 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 the enlisted person who prepared that plane for you, that they mm-hmm. just went through the motions because it wasn't knowledge work. <laughs> would you, would you exactly. be like ready to strap and say, oh, you know, wave me off? Yeah. No way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and you, it's interesting as you pulled a lot of lessons from the military, uh, from our our uh, uh, submarine community, our, our new uh, yes. navy, uh, and then you also have a lot of lessons from the Toyota production system. Clearly, you're a single prize winner and all that. What I, I want to come back to you on this is, you know, the connection to DevOps. The DevOps community has really embraced your thinking, and I'm thankful for that because to me, um, when you start looking at resilience engineering, you start looking at safety differently. Safety two, hop, uh, high reliability theory. Uh, yep. the things that are in your book, those things scale. And why do they scale? Because they're actually, um, they're not case-based things. It's, it's right. real researchers looking at what actually happens and then coming back and saying, Bingo. this is what happens. This is opposed, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to probably upset some folks from saying this. This is opposed to the Agile community, which comes up with case-based approaches and says, here, th- we tried this over here. You should try it. It will work. And, and here's a new book. Here's a teal organization. And then right. here's Brian Rivera speaking at a conference about high reliability theory. And then people turn around saying, you made that up. I'm like, how did I make that up? <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I really appreciate that, uh, that connection that the DevOps community is making with um, um, thinking from a coherent standpoint, what yeah. actually scales, what works. So- uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the connections into the DevOps community from your uh, work uh, on TPS, the Toyota Production System, Lean, and of course uh, our Navy, our, our Navy nuclear programs. Yep. Yeah. So, um, Ponch, you know, you're making mention to reasoning by case and by analogy versus sort of first principles. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just got to say, I'm a big fan of science. Yeah, it's a big fan of science. And uh, let, let me unpack that statement a little bit. Is um, I don't think it made it into the the new book, um, but when I when I present, I, I I make a case that we need theory, we need yeah. science, and the example I give is uh, I put up some pictures of uh, a city in um, Italy, Cremona, Italy. It's where Stradivarius and some of these other geniuses made great violins and cellos and that kind of thing. And the point I make is that that city it's beautiful to visit, but when you start looking at the buildings, they're all the same. And why are they all the same? And this is true of a lot of European cities of that era. You know, wherever you happen to pop down, you say, oh, man, you know, Stockholm, beautiful. But it's like, whoa, they really didn't have much architectural range, did they? And, and this is true for a lot of cities of that era. When you get into kind of the um, the uh, rhetorical questioning as to why that is, well, when you design a building, your first concern is that the building stand up, not fall down. And then he asked the question, well, the folks in the 14, 15, 1600s, what did they know about the reasons buildings stood up and fell, fall down? The answer was they didn't have good science. They had examples, analogy, right? Cases. And so um, when uh, some architect or builder in Cremona, Italy or Stockholm or anywhere else uh, wanted to put up the next building, they said, well, I don't really know why it's going to stand up or fall down, but if I copy one that's standing up, and in fact, if I copy the one that's been standing up the longest, I'm more likely to succeed. And then um, you, know, you start thinking when you start looking at the, the huge variety of architectural styles that happen in so sort of the 17, 18, 1900s. And as an example, I give in this presentation is a contrast between the Statue of Liberty and the Eiffel Tower. They're both products of Eiffel. But unlike Cremona, Italy, which was this repetitiveness, Eiffel has the Statue of Liberty and the, and the, the Eiffel Tower different materials, different locations, different functions, different forms, built within about three years, five years, something like that. He said, how did Mr. Eiffel pull that off? And the answer is he had Isaac Newton. Mm Because Isaac Newton, some years before, had said, hey, look, you know, you're worried about things standing up, falling down, going here, going there, going in circles. He said, actually, there's a really simple way to understand it. Put a force on a mass, and it will go faster and faster and faster, proportional, proportional to the mass. And if you put a moment around the pin, the thing will mm-hmm. spin faster and faster and faster, depending on the strength of the moment. And so you, here you have Eiffel, who's doing the Statue of Liberty, you know, holding a book with 1776 and the toga and the tower. You know, and he says, well, I'm worried about the arm falling off. So what does he do? He draws the arm. And then he asks, you know, computer, literally human computers. And they say, Mr. Eiffel, we've done the calculations. And right over here, the forces don't balance and this joint wants to move. Mm-hmm. Or, or, or Mr. Eiffel over here, 
um, the moments don't balance and, and, and the joint wants to spin. He says, oh, well, let me redraw that. You take that a step further, um, get Frank Gehry with all the crazy bends and this thing and that thing. You say, what did he have that he could do such a huge variety of form and shape and function and material in about a 10 year period? And the thing he had that Eiffel had was Newtonian mechanics. What he had that Eiffel didn't have was computers. So as Eiffel was getting a few calculations per minute from his human computers, Frank Gehry was getting millions of calculations per second from you know all, all this CAD CAM. But anyway, bring that back. Turns out when you look at disciplines, which have huge application of ideas, typically it's some very few principles like F equal MA equal mm -hmm. MC squared, um, that the principles are so sound you can apply them broadly. Right. So th th this comes back to, um, you know, agile, DevOps, lean, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. is that reasoning by analogy is very limiting because it, it invites copying with a little bit of tweaking on the edge. Mm -hmm. But reasoning through first principle, like if we want to solve problems, we need to slow down the, the thinking space. If we, um, if we yes. want to solve problems, this is another mechanism. We want to make sure that the problems themselves are partitioned so they're each piece is simpler to solve. That if we have um if we have first principles, we can get to much better answers much faster about a much wider range of problems than if we're mm -hmm. going by analogy. So Yeah. So my experience in the military is we learned a lot of first principles in fighter aviation. Uh, you know, we have team science from yep. aviation crew resource management. If you looked at uh, nuclear reactors to see how how we do business inside the Navy there, we clearly can't have time. We don't have time for mistakes. You you, you have to trust the science. Yeah. Today, now, I work with a guy whose job is fuel uh, reactor refueling. And yeah. he says, I never want to have an exciting day. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I yeah. never so, want to have an exciting day. So the idea of, of, of you know, agile principles and values into a, yeah. uh, a, a, a high reliability space or a, a fail safe space may not be the best. So it's context determines a method again, right? It's the right. science that says, this is what we need to do. So in organizations today, you do not have time to go learn by analogy. I think right. is that, that's what you're saying. You have to learn by first principles, by science. We're saying yep. the same thing. And if you don't want to do that, there is no requirement to survive or persist in time, right? <laughs> right, right, right. There's no requirement. You can, you can go away, Blockbuster, Kodak, you name it. So I, I think, um, uh, you know, my next question or, or a topic is really about some of the ideas you learned from the new Navy and how do you try to apply those into organizations today? Yes, yeah, great. So uh, this is a, a quick paraphrase on the, your last statement. Edwards Deming, and I'm paraphrasing him, said something like, um, learning is not a requirement, but neither is survival. Uh, right, you can look right. up the quote. It's beautiful. Um, so I as far as uh, lessons learned from the Nuke Navy, so again, you know, for, the, for people who are listening or hearing and um, don't know, is 1955, the United States put the first underpower, uh, the first nuclear powered submarine in the water and uh, the USS Nautilus. And since then, it's had a perfect record that no human being has ever been injured due to reactor failure on board or because of a U.S. Uh, naval reactor ship. And uh, there's been no environmental damage done. And th this is such a far cry from other parts of the military which have tried to work with nuclear power or atomic power. Yes. And, and you know, if you look at the Soviet experience, it's, it's horrific in terms of the number yeah. of submarines and uh, lost and crews, crews killed. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about the um, nuclear Navy is uh, they are wildly fastidious about building feedback into everything they do. In, in the book, you know, we talk about three mechanisms. We talk about slowification to make it easier to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's another mechanism we call amplification. And amplification mm -hmm. is just to make it really obvious you have a problem to solve. It's just like, you know, take the bullhorn and turn it to 11, as it were. Yep. And, um, you know, one of the things that really impressed upon me with uh, when I was learning about the Naval Reactor Program was uh, the fastidiousness, the passion, the energy. There's a guy who works there now. Um, I was at a presentation he was given actually to a bunch of aviators. It was kind of across, uh, across the communities. Mm -hmm. And he stood up in front of these aviators and he said, uh, we are incredibly disciplined about creating standards. And we mm -hmm. are incredibly disciplined about adhering to standards. And I turned around and watched the group. And, you know, you can see they were going through their heads. It's like, oh, you know, naval reactors, a lot of command and control. And he no. said, 
we are incredibly fastidious to make sure that we see right away when the standard is not working. Yeah. What we're saying is that um, the way we get better and smarter is we make like a really aggressive declaration about what we expect to happen with a, mm -hmm. an articulation of the causality behind it. You know, I think if I take action A, I'm going to get outcome um, B and for these reasons. And then they don't just sort of stick to the insistence on keep doing action A, regardless of what the outcome is. They're constantly monitoring. Are we actually doing A? And if not, why not? And then mm -hmm. even if we are, are we getting outcome B? And if not, why not? And that, that was his point. He yeah. said, we have this incredible aggressiveness about making it easy to see that we're having problems. So that triggers yeah. us to swarm on the problems to solve it. So one of the challenges I see coming out of the military is a lot of folks will try to use that across everything they do in an organization. And then that you, it, to me, it, and the science says you can't do that. You can't mm -hmm. spread that because the context changes, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I can't just go in and go super standards across everything, especially if we're looking at uh, novel things, right? We, we need that creativity in there to, right. to kind of that, that uh, safe to fail space, right? That's right. So uh, this is a danger that I see with a lot of military folks that come out and, uh, you know, try to go coach an organization and say, hey, I just got out of the cockpit. We're going to execute flawlessly. We're going to close the gap between where we are and some desired future state. And we're like, well, that's not what complexity science says. That's what effects-based operations showed us in a complicated space that we worked right. in. So it's not a, it's not a one-for-one -one transfer all the, you know, all the time. Right. So there is a danger in that. And I, I think, um, you know, based on our, our previous experiences and, and conversations, uh, you really talk about complexity theory a lot to, to make sure people understand the context. Yep. Uh, and I think that's what is in it. It is a theory. I mean, it's, I'm going to go back to an earlier point you brought up. You have to understand the theory, the first principles. What, what are we trying? What, what does this look like? Yeah. So do you have uh, some th some thoughts on complexity in your uh, in your new book? What we do, uh, it comes up twice. So one, it gets back to this movement from the danger zone to the uh, the winning zone. And um the danger zone being characterized by asking people to solve problems, which are so uh, complex, convoluted, so many intertwined factors mm -hmm. that you just simply can't wrap your head around it. And even if you could, um, the number of people whose efforts have to be coordinated to make a test of change is so many, it becomes impossible. And that the way to solve for that particular problem of highly intertwined things is through partitioning things into smaller pieces mm -hmm. so that um, you can have local control and uh, run high cycle experiments, you know, you know, fast experiments and still have the pieces fit together. One of the examples we give in the book is um, Amazon's discovery of cloud services. And mm -hmm. the background on that, and again, this is a, it's an IT story. So more my co-author Gene Kim than my own. But the way he explains it is that, um, you know, Jeff Bezos is there. He's taken uh, email orders for books. He's taken a shopping cart figuratively, if not literally, across the street to the world's biggest bookstore. That's why he opened up where he opened up originally. He buys the books he needs, brings them back to his office, puts them in a box and sends them out with the post office. And it turns out that there's appeal in that and that um, he finally gets the idea, like, why don't I have my own warehouse rather than walking across the street with the shopping cart? And he needs some business process software over that. And that's going pretty good, as we well know. And then he starts to ask, adding clothing. And as the way um, the case is written, clothing adds a lot of complexity because, you know, you take a book like the flow system, the high velocity edge or wiring the winning organization, and um, it comes in one size, basically, yeah. you know, one size fits all. Um, but you pick pants come in different colors and sizes and fabrics and this thing and that thing. And the number of SKUs explodes on Amazon mm -hmm. and their business process software gets so complex and convoluted that they no longer can update it. That um, and there's some crazy examples, but anyway, they they get they get to the point that to update it, they can only update it you know a handful of times a year, and this affects a lot of the um the um the fang you know that mm -hmm. uh I think it was LinkedIn got to the point, and I don't know if you remember this that there would be times where LinkedIn said you're basically working offline that we have to update mm -hmm. our, serv our servers yeah. right now. And uh, you can look at your page, but you can't do anything with it. And this happened to, across the board. And um, at least, you know, back to the Amazon as an example, I said, this, this is insane. That uh, we, we can't have problems where in order to solve a problem, we have to coordinate the efforts of 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 engineers. And mm -hmm. this is where they came up with this idea of APIs. 
you know, very clean mm -hmm. modular interfaces that allowed um, problems to be contained in these uh, smaller coherent teams. And that within a team, the team could have lots of latitude to iterate, experiment, try new things, so long as they didn't violate the boundary mm -hmm. conditions. Right. And it was that partitioning of the big thing into the little thing. And it got to the point that um, where they were doing a handful of releases a year, they got to the point they were doing thousands of releases per day. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you see this pattern um, over and over, whether it's with Amazon, you know, certainly the same story has to go with Microsoft and its cloud services, Netflix, um, on and on, this taking of very big things and partitioning them into smaller pieces so you get more heads active simultaneously rather than have every, everything tightly coupled. But anyway, let me just, you asked about complexity theory. So what, what, what's the draw here? Throughout the book, we make sure that whatever we say, we've got some luminary to link back to. So slowification back to Daniel Kahneman. Yeah. And um, as far as the complexity theory, we, we hang a lot of hat on Charles Perrault mm -hmm. and the failure of, uh, you know, complex systems. And, and yeah. this whole notion of, coupled systems being very fragile because of the ability of problems to uh, race through. So we, we depend a lot on that to explain the notion of partitioning as a source of great value. Yeah. Yeah. So that, to me, that kind of reminds me of uh, distributed uh, leadership, distributed thinking, distributed work, right? So that yeah. boundary, we, we have boundary spanners. We talk about that. And, and that's the idea there is, um, I hear a lot of companies say that we're one team. I'm like, oh, I don't know that that's yeah. really true because if you were, you would, go back, it would sound like, uh, uh, you know, what LinkedIn was going through several years ago where you That's couldn't right. update anything, right? You, you don't necessarily want that. No, no, no. Want, um, yeah. Now you uh, obviously want the pieces to come together, you know, the team of right, teams effect. Right, right. Um, but, but to me, that, that, point there, it's team of teams, right? Right, it, right. It, right? It's, yeah. And, and to me, when you brought up APIs, when I explain what teaming is, I'm like, it's like an API. It's, it's, you know, how do you actually work across your boundary when you're working with another team? It's the same way you should work within your boundary. Right. Right. So that API, and, and you don't disrupt that. The moment you start bringing in multiple consultants and they show you 50,000 ways to do things, and guess what? You just destroyed any of your uh, AP, human APIs. I hate to, call, that's hate to right. call it that, but that's what it is. 100%. So, um, yeah, uh, so for what it's worth, we um, we make reference in the book to a team of teams. Yeah. And um, when you kind of look beneath the hood and look, look – um, you know, with a process orientation like you and I bring to this kind of thing, you realize they took this uh, one team, but because, you know, it was kind of a weird thing. Um, because there was lack of clarity, and there was a lot of ambiguity. It looked like one team on paper, but it wasn't one team. It was just a lot of scattered pieces. And, um, you know, you, you read through the narrative and team of teams about how the Joint Special Operations Command got way more effective both in mm -hmm. terms of operational tempo when, you know, like 30 X, you know, off the charts and way more effective in getting the bad guys who are doing all these terrible nihilistic, sadistic things. Um, what they did was they started identifying what are the pieces, what were the teams, and then figuring out how to connect them in, yeah. in a uh, much simpler, linear, but um, well-bounded sort of API-like fashion. So information gathered here could be processed and, da -da -da, and then motivate a mission down here. So yeah. uh, same thing. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to throw some caution out there as when we're coaching organizations, the, the assumption is that everybody knows how to work together as a team. And my background in aviation, and I think your experience in, in Navy, uh, Naval reactors uh, doesn't necessarily support that. And what happens is you actually have to learn how to work together as a team. You have to slow down, by the way, you have to slow yep. down to do that. Um, and then you could start to do these amazing mm -hmm. things. It's not like that in industry. Most people in industry, and this is my observation, it's everybody knows how to work together as a team. We just need to throw more processes on and we need to do the, more of these things. I'm like, no, you, you got it backwards. You, yeah. You know? So, so uh, is, is that what you saw in, uh, in the, you know, Navy reactors as well? Yes. Uh, that so, they um, spent some time on teamwork? Well, yeah, I've had some exposure there. The, my lesson to coming out of naval reactors is the big thing about the amplification, the 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 declaration of expectations so that everything is turned into a a very fast feedback experiment. The 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 concern about process is something I really internalized with you know all the time I was learning and I continue to learn from Toyota. The, the reason I just want to, as a parenthetical, um, I still uh, interact with folks there, and I find that every sing single time I interact, it's like I go, "Oh man, I never really thought of that." And to the extent that 30 years ago I thought I was scratching the surface, 
each time I go back, I realize I've scratched the surface even less, you know, but um, so in, in terms of, you know, this whole notion of creating teams and processes, the um, I think a lot of people get it wrong is that they think, oh, we'll create processes, procedures, routines sort of top down and then um, have people adhere to them. And one of the things that I really came to appreciate with um, Toyota is uh, what we're calling with what client now mechanic centric, mm-hmm. which and it could be doctor centric, nurse centric, chef, clerk, coder centric, yeah. whatever, but centric around the person is doing the actual transformative work of the organization by which value gets built up and, and accrues so they can someday be delivered. When you go um, top down with these elaborate processes and procedures and initiatives, this and that, chances are they don't fit actually the conditions that someone needs to be successful. You flip that over though, and you start to asking the question, well, in order to get this work done, it has these various steps that have to be accomplished. We're asking this person to bring their skill, their expertise, their motivation, their inspiration to do this task. What do they need? What do they need in terms of materials, permissions, engineering instructions, skills, capabilities, uh, tooling, et cetera? What do they need? And then you work backwards from that to see if you can connect the uh, the connective thread to ensure that everything is flowing to the point of use. Um, and then, so what ends up happening is the process is derivative of the need rather than the behavior being derivative of the process. Yeah, yeah. I like that. That's nice. Uh you know, I got a few minutes left with you. Uh, mental health. Did you put any mental health considerations into the new book? Or are you, you thinking about the individual? Like, how, yeah. how, does, how does this really affect them? This, this- well, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, when you start with uh, a mechanic-centric or a nurse or doctor or a coder-centric view, you're really asking the question, what conditions does a leader have to create so that individual can be successful? And uh, again, I want to step out and I think, you, you know, you and I are like in such, you know, sound, loud agreement on this is that success is not just um, a quantification of material transformation. And on, on this, I'm going to channel Paul O'Neill again. Again, mm-hmm. Paul ran this enormous organization and took it from typical for its sector to the best in the world. And when you ask Paul, Paul, you know, how did you... Um, manage that transformation, you know, thousands of employees, tens of thousands of employees, hundreds of locations, dozens of countries, et cetera. He said, no, it was all three questions, three questions. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, um, we had three questions. We expected that everyone would be asking those for whom they were responsible. Ask these questions every day. Question one, did you feel prepared to succeed today? And um, anytime someone said no, we knew we had homework for tomorrow. Because why would we ask someone to step into a situation knowing that they were ill-prepared? So that was question one. The second question, this ties right to your, your question about mental health and emotional well-being. The second question was, when you did your work, did someone whose, value, whose opinion you value, did they appreciate what you did? And did they let you know they appreciated it? And, and Paul's attitude was that if... Um, someone didn't let you know they appreciated what you did, Mm -hmm. boom, that was a problem to be solved. And then his third question was uh, on top of, did you feel prepared to succeed when you did your work? Did you feel the work was appreciated? Then the third question was, and when you left at the end of the day, did you feel the way you spent your time added value to your own life? Mm -hmm. And again, that was a kind of question which yes or no. And if the answer was no, we've got homework to do tomorrow to make sure that you're set up to do things that actually make you feel important also. Anyway, I think that ties back to your point about um, mental health and emotional well-being. Because if you're answering yes on all of those, you're probably Mm -hmm. contributing to someone's sense of well-being. If you answer no on any of them, maybe not. And if you're answering no on all of them, basically you're saying to people, hey, show up at work today. Uh, It's going to be frustrating. You're going to fail. And uh, you you're going to feel like you wasted your time. So I, I think in this uh, labor constrained environment, um, you know, future employees, employees that are shifting work need to be asking these questions. And and the question should be, are you following coherent practices in here? Or are you following, yep. uh, are you, you copying somebody else? If they're copying somebody else, you probably ought to run away. And I'm not, I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong. I'm just going back to the first principles. Yep. Here. 
So um, employees today, if I were them, and which we are, um, I would want to find an organization that is thinking like you're thinking and like Gene Kim yeah. is thinking, right? Because that is how you're going to feel better as a human uh, going to work, right? Uh, oh, Punch, you know, think about, you know, you spend all those years in the military and you think about how the military attracts people to do things like you did and you, 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 your, your uh, shipmates did. It ain't pay. It ain't pay, right? It's um, the pitch is it's almost like the Paul O'Neill pitch, which is we're inviting you to do something which is really, really important. And uh, we're not going to pay you a lot for it. But at the end of every day, and certainly at the end of whatever your uh, enlistment is or whatever else that happens be your career, is that you will be able to look back and say, I did something important and other people appreciated me for doing it. I mean, we're yeah. what a perfect set of sentiment to express because we're recording this today on Veterans Day, right? Yeah. But boom, that's the pitch. And uh, you think about um, the, the people you and I know outside the military who've made commitments to careers where you look at it and say, man, you know, the skills you have, the talents you have, you could be making a ton more money doing something mm-hmm. else. But you yeah. know the reason they picked um, – caring services, teaching, you know, whatever else it happens to be is because every day they knew they could show up and do something where when they left, it it was important that they did it because if it had gone undone, the world would be worse off. Yeah. And when they went home, they were like, you know what? Not only was important, I did it, but people are glad I was there today. We we started. Yeah. yeah. Just one last digression. We start the book with, um, this, uh, it's right in the preface. It's a statement that every day, and, and this is not exactly right, but every day people badge in, budge in, scan in, swipe in, and otherwise arrive to say, I'm here. And for some people, the day is um, qualifies on all those Paul O'Neill standards. I, I, they, they have a sense of success. They have a sense of connectivity to something much, much bigger than themselves. And, the, and because of that, they feel like they've done something valuable. And then we, then we say, yeah, but unfortunately, that's not true for a lot of people. When they yeah. badge in, budge in, scan in, swipe in, punch in, whatever else, that they know they're working, walking into a situation that is going to be dreary, drudgery, maybe danger. And the fact that they were there will go unappreciated and maybe even unnoticed. Yeah. And, and, and then we say, you know, and the rest of our book is how to get from that situation to the, the former one. No. Hey, I want to I want to thank you for many reasons. Uh, number one is that your support in the U.S. Navy. Uh, you know, you were doing a lot of work with uh, uh, Admiral Richardson many years ago, yep. several years ago. Uh, we had some you know horrible things happen in, in 2017. Uh, we really helped get us sorted in the right direction with uh, high velocity learning, uh, and, and really built off your book, High Velocity Edge. There, uh, that's number one. Number two, I want to thank you on behalf of Nigel and John for your support on the flow system. That's awesome. Oh, absolutely, uh, good stuff. Yeah, it's you know when we we all got together down in, in Dallas a few years ago, uh, the conversation you know it could have gone on for hours and hours, just like yeah. this one can. Uh, unfortunately, I got to step out and go have have a quick lunch in here and. Go get in a flow state with uh, some some buddies in the, in the area here. We can talk about you got that. It. Yeah, um, but everybody needs to go get wiring the organ, uh, winning organization, um, and I think that comes out in a few weeks. Yep. Um, get into that. Ask questions. Uh, you, you have a huge network. You have the DevOps community. Is there anything you want to leave with our listeners about how they can contact you or how they should look for you online? Yeah. Look, I'm I'm on LinkedIn. You know something, something, Steve Spear, and, you know, you can find my email and whatever else. Mm-hmm. And, and I just encourage Punch, just like we're having this conversation now, is that uh, there are those of us who've um, had exposure, whether it was naval reactors, Toyota, this place, mm-hmm. that place, the naval aviation, you know, we, we've all had these experiences of what it's like to be those people who badge in, budge in, sign in, whatever else it is, and know the day is going to be phenomenal in terms of taking our time, our effort, our energies, and putting it to good use. Yeah. And, um, it, this, it, I think I think we should just leave people with the thought that tomorrow can be much better. Be tomorrow can be much better than today, and uh, it's not a brute force thing. It's about creating conditions in which people can give much greater expression to their potential to be creative, creative beings. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. That's awesome. And we're going to wrap it up on that. I want to thank uh, Dr. Stephen Spear for being with us today. And I definitely want to invite you back on the show where there's so much more we can talk about. Resilience engineering, DevOps. Uh, We didn't even get a chance to talk about the OODA loop today, but we don't need to because it's, you know, OODA loop is something we're always going through. 
It's how we sense the world, how we make decisions, how we act in it, how we perceive reality. All right. Thank you, Steve.